Welcome to Code with JV. I have got a treat for you today. Open Interpreter, an open source implementation of OpenAI's Advanced Data Analysis, or Code Interpreter as it used to be called. I've been giving it a pretty good kick and I reckon it's ready to use. It's got some limitations, it's early, but hey, let's see what it can do. You can go to openinterpreter.com or just look for it on GitHub. It's a Python project, so you can install it with pip and run it with interpreter and get into a command line interface, which is similar to code interpreter, except this has access to the internet and it can let you install any package you want. Also, open source developers are piling in and it's getting better faster. So there's lots of things you can do as well as you can run it with a local Llama model instead of paying OpenAI to use their API. If you haven't seen Code Interpreter before, it was released well, a few months ago. It got a lot of buzz because of the capability uplift it did because essentially you're asking ChatGPT to do something and instead of it just trying to make things up or go from its memory, it would write some Python code to do the task. They used it for like logic problems. They used it for analyzing data, creating graphs, that kind of stuff. But the main thing is that OpenAI are now calling it advanced data analysis. And it's a key part in them upselling into their larger plans. You get limited access on the plus plan with like 50 messages every three hours. On the enterprise one, it's unlimited. No other AI platforms really had something equivalent to this. And now... Open source developers, we've all got access to it, and it's pretty good in my opinion. Here's what the actual code interpreter, or what is it, advanced data analysis now. Hey, that's harder to say. Good luck with the naming. Here's a spreadsheet, and this is fake sales data I just downloaded from the internet. Nothing interesting in there. Please analyze it and give me useful insights. A very high level objective. They went, they said, okay, what are the sheets that live in this thing? What's the data that lives in this? It's guessing the right sheet as the only one with data in it, etc. But you can go and see, this is the Python code it wrote to do this job. It takes the response, then it uses that in its next step. Then it writes some more Python code, takes that response, uses that in its next step. Sometimes it will ask for prompts and keep going. At the end of it, I'm getting it to make graphs of sales data, give it a PDF report, which is you know, generic and goes like so. A very simple demo sort of test case for it. But it was pretty quick to do. I'd say that the actual plugin, I've had access to it for ages. I haven't lent on it very much. It's not something I've needed to use in my workflow. But already I'm using Open Interpreter to do useful work because it runs on my machine. Let's have a look at it. A couple of tips. The first one is I suggest you run it in a virtual environment. I really like Conda personally. I've made an environment. I'm calling it OI for Open Interpreter because I don't like to type very much. If you install Open Interpreter, we'll get it installed for you. I've already got it installed, so it should just say, hey, you've already got it. I suspect there's a lot of people today who are mistyping the word interpreter. And they're like, so, so if you type this, it'll get you into a shell where you're starting to do things. But before you do that, I recommend you set up some aliases because I find it's one of those tools which I'm actually reaching for quite a bit and mistype interpreter to get autocomplete firing, it's a pain. Typing oi, never mess that up. And I just channel my Australian heritage. You type help, it's got some flags on it. So you can see H for help. By default, it's going to ask you every time it's going to run code on your machine as a safety thing. You can just make it run it. I've made my vanilla alias with the minus Y because I find I don't want to be prompted mostly. A good metaphor to think about is like watching a self-driving car, like hands on the wheels, looking at the road, ready to hit control C if it starts doing something you don't want it to do on your local machine because it can trash your environment. Fast will drop you down to GPT three and a half, so it'll be faster and cheaper. L will run it locally. And they've done a lot of work integrating with Code Llama. It's a bit finicky. There's gotchas. It takes some effort to set up. Once you have got it set up, it'll be fast and it'll be free and it won't be as good. You won't be able to do as complex things with it. So you can start to reach for that tool when it makes sense to. You can also use it with Azure. It's quite a small code base, but it's good enough to launch and to start building on top of. Let's see what it takes to redo what we did with OpenAI. What have we got? So I made a sales data XLS. I'm going to go, oi. When you throw in flags, it doesn't give you that nice prompt at the beginning I found. Here I'm going to say, read the sales orders sheet from sales data. Quite a high level of objective. Let's see what it does. Remember, this has got the minus Y flag, so it is not going to ask me. It's just going to start doing things. So usually I'm watching and going, do I like what it's doing? I'll oh, control C if I don't want it to. So it's saying I need to get some packages, pandas and open peel, pikes, pikesel. Uh, these things are all meant to be read, not said anyway. Here it's going, it's installing these things. I've probably had these installed before when I was playing around, so it was a pretty fast there. Now it's starting to say, let's load the sales orders sheet and have a look at the data. It's got this, the sales orders. Okay, it's doing a little sample of this is what the data looks like. It's got it in a data frame. What's it doing now? It's looking at the same column. So it, it's GPD-4 running this. So it's a very similar logic that happened in the actual advanced data analysis plugin. So I'm not surprised that it's fairly similar because it's the same language model with slightly different wrappers around it. Here it's starting to, oh, this is a bit different though. It's starting to get me some sample data. Is there any missing data in the data form? Nope. And now it's starting to look at the columns. 
we're getting some counts mean so it's churning away because I've got it on minus y it's just going to keep doing this until it finishes and says I'm done or I hit control c and I interrupt it most important part who is the top salesperson no it's not even doing that yet it is just getting the the unique lists of them it's an overview it's explored the data it's done some initial analysis and now I might just ask it for some things Make me a PDF, I want sales by person over time, etc., and some commentary about observable trends. So that looks like it was getting the data out. I have found that it's slower and more verbose than the ChatGPT implementation. From my experience so far, I, I would describe the ChatGPT one as superior, and I would use that if I was trying to really do some data analysis type stuff like this particular task. I wouldn't use this as the primary use case of Open Interpret. If you don't have access to the paid plan and you can't get access to the, the real plugin, this might be a good substitute for it. But if you do have access, I'd probably lean on that for all of those like data analysis in a box type of jobs. I'll show you next what I can only do with Open Interpret though. Okay, installing matplotlib. So this should make the graphs for us in the sales report. It's gone and saved some PNG files of all that data. Okay, PDF generation library in the house. And now it's manually creating a bunch of things in a PDF. One of the critiques I've heard about the advanced data analysis from like real data people is it's rare that I'm just going to have it stuck in a spreadsheet. Usually I have got a database, big data sets, and you just can't get them in there. I think this is the use case where you would see people lean on this tool because you just can't use the open AI one for it. Salesreport.pdf. Let's see how it went. Sales by region. So again, you can see the numbers are the same. Here's a sales graph. It's formatted a little bit. Okay, it's messed up the, the text wrapping a little bit, which if you've ever tried to write a PDF is an easy thing to do. So that, that's a, a demo of how you might want to use it in that way. And I think it's a useful use case, but I would say unless you are working with a data set you can't get into advanced data analysis or you don't have access to it, uh, I probably wouldn't lean on as much for this. The stuff I would actually do with it, let's go over here. This is the open interpreter repo itself. I'm in the main branch. It is a fairly small code base. So if you are interested in contributing to open source, I would say this is an easy one to get your head around. It's also a very vibrant community. There's a lot of stuff going on, so it's quite a busy one. They're still figuring out their open source processes. So it's got pros and cons. But one of the things I noticed here, hey, you get megabytes for a really small code base. That's a bit strange. Ah, oh, it all lives in the .git folder. That tells me some large files were committed previously in the Git history, and they've been cleaned out since, but they haven't been cleaned from the history, which means the first time you do a Git clone, you're going to notice this takes a bit to download, unless you're on a super fast internet. For most of us, like I noticed it, I'll go Git clone, I'm like, oh, that's a big repo. And I look at the code base and go, ah, someone's committed some large files. It's really easy to do, really common to do, see it all the time. It's also a bit of a mongrel to clean up. Like there's this thing called Git filter branch, which you can do, pretty slow, pretty finicky. When you try and run it, Git itself warns you and says, hey, watch out, this thing's a bit finicky. There's another tool called B BFG, which is the way I would actually clean out large files. But this is the sort of thing which Open Interpreter can actually do for you. Like say you've just heard those words but never done it before. Well, hey, let's use Open Interpreter to get it done. So again, boy, I'm not going to do the whole Australian chart, but I'm thinking it in my head. There's lots of ways you can go about this, but a simple one is just show me all the files which are in the Git history but aren't in the current repo. That should quickly show us, you know, what sort of stuff's going on. If this was a JavaScript project, I'd say, ah, oh, someone's committed a node modules folder. I'm guessing it's a virtual environment from Python. And so here it's essentially saying, let's make a plan. Now it's using a git log command. Oh, look at that, VN. So virtual environment in Python. That's going to take a lot of scrolling to get through. Let's just stop that. So this is a sort of command of like use BFG, so it's a library and it probably won't have it installed, so it's gonna try and install it for us. It's in Java, so you need to have Java running on your computer, but also, if you don't have Java, it's gonna try and install it. It's one of those things where it can do the steps it needs to get something up and running. So if you're new to the terminal, this I think can be a really useful tool for you. Just be really cautious about watching it. You might wanna really be in prompting mode, so you're like you're watching each command and you're double checking it. Whereas if you're a bit more confident or comfortable, you might let it auto go and just you know control C when you're not happy with it. We've got Java. So whenever it's getting a link from memory, it's probably not the most recent one, but it's a fairly stable library. So I'd expect this to be sufficient, even if it's not the most latest. Oh, and it's just grabbing it, sticking it in the local folder. It's trying to move it to use a local pen. I don't want to do that. Instead, I'm just going to say, just run it from this directory. I love that I don't have to worry about typos whenever I'm talking to large language models, they just get it. This is me interrupting it, like I don't need it to clone a repo, I'm just doing this for demo purposes. Uh, it's not like I'm going to be doing something with a cleaned one. In the time it's taken to do this, maybe I could have looked up the BFG code base and said, oh, okay, what do I do and type to 
get the VM done. But this is more of a demo rather than how I'd actually use it for this case. It has pruned it. See how much space that got rid of. So we've gone from like 88 to 19. It's still not done yet. It tells me that there's some non-VM folders in there which need removing. Let's find other, the rest of them. We got in here. I see a, a wheel file with NumPy. Wheel will be the biggest ones, I think. And this is the sort of task that you just couldn't do with OpenAI because it's running on your machine. It's doing a task for you on your local machine. This is where I've actually been using it a little bit already, and I expect I'll be using it mostly, is for sort of machine management DevOpsy type tasks. Maybe I'll use it for small coding tasks or small scripting tasks, because if I was to use Ada to write a script, well, I'm entering into a dev cycle. I'm starting to think about things, whereas giving Open Interpreter a mission of like write a script to do X, Y, and Z, it can actually write it, debug it, run it, etc. I think it could be a bit faster for small script development. And what are we at? 1.4 meg, hey, we've gotten it right down. This is the sort of task which a lot of people, especially when you're new to developing, you wouldn't have bumped into it before. And you'd have to do a bunch of research to figure out what and how to do it. And just having a tool which can do it and tell you what to do and get it done for you, it's gonna be a bunch of a speed up for people. The last thing I'll show you is, oh, let's do it the slow way. Yeah, that's right, local, like so. It's going to ask you what parameter size you want, and it's going to download the model for you. So I found on my graphics card, I was using 13 and medium was about what it could do. If I'm running my video stuff, it's not going to work. So I actually downloaded this model and let's use GPU. It's going to try and download it if it's not installed already. If it is, it's just going to jump in here. Hey, graphics cards whirring, but it looks like I'm still recording. This is where you could use it for quite simple tasks like Etc. It's starting to make a script. Would you like to run this code? No. I've noticed that the code interpreter, it's actually faster than ChatGPT. So I'm looking forward to the day where I've got more powerful, bigger context window Llama models on my machine or on my network, because then I think it would actually be quite fast to use. And you can imagine doing this automated and parallel in lots of different things. Last thing I'd say, quick look through the repo. Contributors, so like most open source, it's one person doing the big heavy lifting, people joining in recently. You can see that it's been going for a couple of months. I'm really impressed with waiting, getting it ready, and then a fairly effective launch day where it got to the top of GitHub trending. It got, what are we up to now? 10,500 people have started quite quickly. A lot of people jumping into Discord, a lot of people getting excited on this and getting a lot of coverage from all of the AI bloggers and wannabe YouTubers. <laughs> it's getting a lot of attention. And so I think it's a good demonstration about what a successful open source launch can look like, particularly when you are going after a feature, which is a desirable feature, which exists in a closed platform, but you can reproduce parts of it or all of it in a fairly accessible way. I don't think it lives up to the height of the same quality as advanced data analysis, but I think it's comparable on lots of fronts. And I think it's going to get better very quickly. I wouldn't be surprised if it starts to have more features and better features than the GPT ones do because of the speed that's possible with an open source swarm. Really exciting to see. Hope you enjoyed the video today. Consider giving it a like or a subscribe if you want to see more of this stuff. I'm really focusing in on the intersection between AI, education, and programming. Codewithjv.com has a lot of the things I offer. I'll be doing a new course again soon, and I run an ongoing membership, and I just support people to become better developers. And also, how to use AI to become a better developer faster, because there's a ton of stuff which is coming out quickly, and it's changing the landscape. So that's all at codewithjv.com. Take care.